give us the ability to worship you through our mouths, through our words, through the songs that we sing. We ask that you would continue to speak to us tonight as we open up your word. We ask that you would have your way with the rest of, uh, of this service, with the rest of tonight. And we ask that most importantly you would be with us. That you would be with us and that you would remind us of the truth. That you are with us, that you are here now, and you are for us, and you are not against us. And so, God, we thank you for all that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, you guys can have a seat. What did you guys think of that video, huh? Pretty ridiculous. Pretty awesome. Something about that song makes me feel like I can run through a brick wall. I don't know what it is. I'm so serious. That's cinder block. We'll try it if it was brick, but it's cinder block. You know There's a brick wall. There's a wood up behind you. I guess you can do that. Anyway. There's drywall. There's wood. Come on. You have plenty of options. There's a big hero speech. Um, all right. I'm super glad you guys are here tonight. Um, I think that the message that I've got for you guys is, is really powerful. I think it's really um, impactful. It's very real for me. I'm going to be preaching to myself probably more than I'm preaching to you guys. So I really hope you guys get something out of it. Does anybody have? Uh, does anybody need a Bible? Is anybody missing a Bible? Everybody got one? There's an extra one right here. If somebody, if somebody needs one? All set? Tyler, you look like you're looking for one. Yeah? Okay. Cool. All right, if everybody's got a Bible then we can get started. Um, so tonight, I'm going to be continuing with the sermon series that I started last week. If you guys were here last week, you know that we started a new sermon series called Lying to Myself. Lying to Myself. Um, and this sermon series is essentially about, um, the, the whole premise behind it is that, that I believe that there is a battle going on at all times for control of your mind. There's a battle going on for control of your mind between God and between the devil. Um, and they're constantly battling it out. And th whoever uh, ultimately wins that war and whoever gets control of your battle is up to you. And it's, and it's up to you to decide what you're going to think about, what you're going to choose to give your mind over to. Um, and so last week I kind of started it off with just a general introduction. And starting this week and moving forward for the next several weeks, we're going to take one lie each week, and we're going to look at one lie that we commonly tell ourselves, and we're going to look at what is the truth that God says about that lie? What is the truth that silences that lie? Because we're always lying to ourselves. We're always telling ourselves things that are not true. Um, and so the lie we're looking at tonight, and the title of my message tonight is, I'm not enough. That's why I played that song. I'm not enough. It's a lie. And we're going to find out why tonight. Uh, so if you've got your Bibles, which you all should, you can turn with me to Judges, chapter 6. Judges, chapter 6. Judges, chapter 6. One or one? Chap uh, yep, verse 1. Judges, chapter 6. And now for those of you who don't know, the book of Judges is... Um, it was written about a time period in, in, uh, in Israel's history, which was called the period of the Judges. And uh, essentially what was going on at this point was Moses had already brought the people of Israel out of Egypt and brought them into the Promised Land. And then he gave control over to his successor, Joshua. And then Joshua eventually grows old and he dies after having an incredibly uh, successful military career. And when he dies, Nobody really steps up and takes over. And so Israel's kind of scattered right now. They're kind of in a place of turmoil. They don't really have any government. They don't really have any leadership. And not to mention they're in this new territory with enemies literally all around them and uh, constantly trying to kill and destroy them. And so it was a very difficult time to be living in Israel at this time. And so this is a time period that we're going to be reading about. We're basically going to be reading about one of the uh, enemies that, that was fighting Israel at this time, the, the nation of Midian, the Midianites. Uh, this is the beginning of the story of Gideon, but we won't get much into Gideon today. Um, all right, so chapter 6, verse 1. Everybody there? All right, I'm going to be reading 1 through 6. It says, 
Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelter for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern people invaded the country. They, uh, they camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded uh, the land to ravage it. Midian uh, so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. They cried out to the Lord for help. So let's pray, and then we will uh, start attacking this. Jesus, we thank you for your word, which is truly alive and truly does speak. I pray that it would speak to us tonight. I pray that it would encourage us and that it would build us up and make us a little bit better so that we would all leave here a little bit better than we came in. Lord, this is our prayer tonight, that you help us understand that the lies that the enemy have been telling us are just that. They are lies. Help us to see the truth that you say about us that shut up those lies. Lord, we love you and praise you. Speak to us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't remember the first time that I ever heard the lie that I'm not enough. Um, I feel like, if I'm being honest with you, I feel like I've been hearing that lie all my life. Um, I really, I, I feel like I've been hearing that lie all my life from other people, from myself, from the devil, from all over the place. I've always been hearing the voice in my head telling me that I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm not fast enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not whatever, but I'm just not enough. And I don't remember the first time I ever heard it, but I do remember one time in particular where that thought was particularly pervasive in my mind. It was when I was in sixth grade and I was going out for football for the first time. It was the first time I was ever going to play football. I was a little kid, I was, I was really tiny, but I was really fast and I was really athletic and so I was convinced that I was going to be the next Wes Welker. I mean, I was convinced I was going to be the next Wes Welker. He was my hero. And, uh, and so I had huge dreams, I had super high hopes coming into sixth grade football. Um, and, and in Pop Warner, which was the league that I played for, they had this rule where no matter how bad the kid was, the coach always had to play them for at least seven plays. And it was just so that, you know, everybody got a chance. I kid you not, that season I did not play a single game where I played more than seven plays. I don't know how, I don't know how my coach got away with it, but I'm pretty sure I played less than seven plays on a couple of games. And I don't really know why he didn't want to give me a chance, but for whatever reason, my coach never gave me any chances. He never gave me a shot. I was playing lineman, which I was clearly not a lineman. I was literally Cameron size. And I was, I was not meant to be a lineman. And, um, and, and that's where he had me. And so it was like every practice, I would work as hard as I could. And I would do everything that I could to try to prove myself. And I would still never get a chance in the game. I was barely playing the minimum amount of plays each game. My coach just wouldn't give me a chance. He just had his favorites. And that's who we're going to play. And that was that. That was the end of the story. And so I know he wasn't trying to tell me this, but it felt like in my head, all he was telling me over and over again, all throughout the season, every practice, every game, was that I am not enough. I am not enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not big enough. I'm not fast enough. I'm not strong enough. And I'm just not enough. Now, I know that that's not what he was actually trying to do. I know that he, I don't know, maybe he had the right intentions in mind. But, but that's what he told me. And that's what I started to tell myself. And because I started believing those lies that were coming into my head, I became incredibly, incredibly insecure from a very, very young age. Um, I became incredibly insecure from a very young age. And it was because I was listening to the lies that the devil was telling me instead of believing and listening to the truth that God was trying to tell me. And I think that if you look at this chapter of the Bible, I think that the exact same thing that happened with me where I created my own insecurity by not listening to God, I think the same thing happened to Israel. You see, my insecurity was what you would call an enemy of my own creation. It was an enemy of my own creation. It was created 
because I was believing things about myself that weren't true. I was choosing to believe things about myself that were not true. So it was an enemy of my own creation. And Midian was an enemy of Israel's own creation. It says right here in the beginning that, uh, that Midian began to attack Israel because they had disobeyed God, because they were doing what was evil in the sight of God. And so, and so in that way, Midian is a lot like the way that our insecurity attacks us. It, in, it, it attacks us because of the way that we listen to God or because of the way we don't listen to God a lot of times. You see, I believe, and I believe that this is true, that no matter what you're struggling with, no matter what kind of insecurity you're facing, the reason that you're facing that insecurity is because you have chosen to believe the lie that you're not enough. The reason that we're all so insecure is because we have chosen to believe what the devil is telling us, that we're not enough, instead of believing the truth that God says about you. So we've got to listen to the truth that God says. Most of you guys remember my friend John, right? Grace's brother? Yes. Yeah, he came and preached a couple a couple months ago. Um, so like I, I, I'm sure I've told you guys before, I, I've been friends with him. I've been best friends with him since high school. Um, I will never forget this one season of his life. I have no idea what possessed him to go through this. But he went through this season of his life where every single time he was driving with somebody in the car, he would do exactly the same thing. He would just be driving along, going down the road, and he would decide to slam on the brakes randomly and scream at the top of his lungs. It was absolutely terrifying. So we'd be driving around, and Did you call a therapist? Nobody, nobody, nobody was expecting it, and all of a sudden he would slam on the brakes, go ah, just like that, like a really sharp, high pitched scream, and it would scare the crap out of me every single time. Even when I knew it was coming. I would get in the car like shaking because I'm so afraid for him to do this. And I knew it was coming and it would still scare me every time. And, 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 and I think that the reason that he did that was because he really enjoyed, he got some sort of sick enjoyment out of watching the way that different people react to fear. It, it is funny. And, and, and I got a lot of enjoyment out of it too when it didn't scare me, but it scared me all the time. Um, and so, and so he did it because he wanted to. He wanted to, to to see the way that different people react to fear. And yeah. psychologists say, and I'm sure you've heard this before. Psychologists say that there's two main ways that we react to fear. It's the fight or flight mechanism. Actually, there's three. There's fight, flight, and freeze. Fight, flight, and freeze. That's 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 good. I, I I think that Grace freezes. I think Grace freezes. She tells me all the time she was. Um, Whenever she's in a scared situation or scary situation, she just completely freezes and looks completely calm. But instead, and anyway, so the two main ones though are fight and flight, and um, and I believe that this fight or flight mechanism um, attacks you every or, or you react in this way every single time an enemy attacks you. This fight or flight mechanism is how you react every single time. Um, an enemy attacks you. So when an, an enemy when an enemy attacks, you have two options. You have two uh, options of how to handle it. You can either run and hide, or you can stand and fight. You can run and hide, or you can stand and fight. So guess which one the Israelites were doing? Exactly. The Israelites were running and hiding. They were what I would call flighters. Instead of fighters, they were flighters. So when Midian attacked them, they didn't just not fight, they actually ran away and hid inside of caves. That's what it says right in verse 2. It says that they ran and they hid in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Um, and so they weren't just not fighting, they were actually hiding in caves. And the reason they would hide in these caves was because it made them feel safe. They felt safe when they hid from their enemy. They felt safe inside of these caves. And so what I want to ask you guys tonight is what is your cave? What is your cave? You see, we all have a cave. We all have a place that we go to or a thing that we run to when we're faced with fear. And that's what a cave represents. The cave represents that place that you go to or that thing that you run to when you're faced with fear. And now a lot of people have different caves. A lot of people have different things that they go to when they're insecure or afraid. 
Some of the most common ones that I've seen, I've wrote down here. I've got, I'm going to share a couple of them with you. Um, I've seen a lot of people use relationships as their cave. So they're super insecure, and so they just go from boy to boy to boy, or from girl to girl to girl, dating everyone that they see. That's they break up. <laughs> they break up with. They break up with one person, and they instantly have to find another boyfriend because they're so insecure. They're trying to find their self worth in someone else. They're trying to find their self worth in someone else. I've seen that so many times. Um, drugs and alcohol are another cave. Drugs and alcohol are another cave that a lot of people run to when uh, when they're faced with something uh, scary or when they're faced with insecurity. Personally, this was mine when I was in high school. When I was in high school, alcohol was my cave. Alcohol was what I ran to whenever I was insecure. I was incredibly insecure of my ability to socialize with people. And so when I would go out to parties, I would have to get as drunk as I possibly could in order to socialize, in order to uh, get along with people. And so I would just drink so much because I was trying to cover up my insecurities. So alcohol was my cake. Another one that I've been guilty of in the past um, is pride or success. You see, a lot of people, a lot of people, when they're faced with insecurity, instead of dealing with that issue, they just want to take the, uh, the focus off of whatever they're insecure. And so if I'm insecure about my weakness over here, instead of actually fixing this, or instead of working on this, I'm going to just try to get everybody to pay attention to my strengths. And so I'm going to try to puff myself up, I'm going to build myself up, try to make myself look better than I actually am, all to cover the fact that I'm cripplingly insecure. That's another one that I've gone to a lot in my life. Um, another common cave that people go to a lot is um, the back cave. No, is putting others down. This is this is one that is particularly toxic because it's uh, it's incredibly mean. Uh, if you've ever if you've ever known someone who it just seems like they've always got something nasty to say to you, they've always got something mean to say to you. They're always trying to put you down. Chances are it's because they are themselves incredibly insecure. And they see you up here and they feel like they're down here and they're trying to pull you down to their level. Um, chances are it's because they're super insecure and that's their cave. And then the last one that I want to share with you guys is praise. A lot of people use praise as a cave. When they're feeling insecure, they'll do things to try to make people comment on them. If you've ever heard, if you've ever heard um, the term you're fishing for a compliment, You'll see like girls, they'll go on Instagram and post half-naked pictures of themselves and, and they're just trying to get affirmation from what other people think about them. They're just trying to get affirmation and it's just because they're insecure and they're trying to hide their own insecurity. And so what I want to tell you tonight is that whatever your cave is, whether it's a relationship or if it's pride or alcohol, drugs, whatever your cave is, it feels safe, but your cave is a false sense of security. Oh this my God. is exactly <laughs> this is exactly what your cave is doing to you, and this is exactly what um, what Israel was doing when they were hiding in their caves. You see, they believed that they were safe, and they were trying to convince themselves that they were safe. This is my favorite meme of all time. They were trying to convince themselves they were safe, but it was a false sense of safety. They were really in, in an insane amount of danger. They were in an incredible amount of danger. Um, you see, uh, I, 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 remember, I remember back when I was little, I used to, uh, and I'm sure you guys can relate, I used to like have times when I was trying to fall asleep and I couldn't fall asleep, so my imagination would just start like, running crazy, and then all of a sudden I'd hear a noise downstairs and I'd be certain that there's someone with a knife downstairs in the kitchen, and I'd just be terrified. And so what do you do when you're a little kid in that situation? I go... You hide under the cover. Yeah. What are the covers doing to you? What are the covers doing to you? The covers are, are your cave. You're, it's, it's a false sense of safety that we get. If somebody actually came into your room with a knife, those covers would do absolutely nothing to help you. But they make us feel good as little kids because it's this false sense of security. How many of you guys saw the newest Jurassic, what is it, Jurassic World or Jurassic Park movie? 
Do you guys remember the scene at the end of the movie? There's there's literally a enormous like velociraptor on steroids tearing through this house and this little girl it gets into this room with this little girl and the little girl runs into bed and pulls the cover over covers over her. There's a dinosaur in her room and she's hiding under the covers. What is that going to do? Literally nothing. It's going to throw the dinosaur off. But that, and, and that's exactly what was happening with the Israelites. The, in, in verses 5 and 6 in this chapter that I just read, in verses 5 and 6, it's very clear that the Is, while the Israelites were hiding in their caves, while they were running off and hiding in the caves that they created to hide from the Midianites, the Midianites were out in the country, out in the fields, completely destroying everything in Israel. They were destroying their crops, they were destroying their animals, they were destroying their towns. And so I think this meme, which is one of my favorite memes, memes perfectly exemplifies what the Israelites were doing. They're sitting here while everything around them is being destroyed, and they're telling themselves, I'm okay, I'm okay, this is fine, it's not a big deal. And we like to point the finger at them and blame them and laugh at them. But here's the truth. We do the same exact thing. We do the same exact thing. We hide when we're feeling insecure. We hide in our caves and we hide behind our relationships or, or we try to drown out the pain with alcohol. But meanwhile, the insecurity is still inside of us. And it's destroying us, and it's only getting stronger and stronger and stronger. You see, while Israel was hiding in their caves, Midian was running free. Midian was running around free. And they were just taking everything that they needed, and they were growing, and they were getting stronger and more dangerous. And that's exactly what happens with our insecurity, when instead of facing it and dealing with the insecurity itself, we just try to cover it up and hide it or push it away. All it's doing is growing and growing and growing inside of you. And so you have to actually deal with the insecurity for it to go away. So do you see this cycle that's happening here? Do you see the cycle of, in I call it the cycle of insecurity. Jace, Jesse, hang on. So it's this cycle of insecurity. And it, and it happens in this story too. We see Midian attacks Israel, and that creates fear, and the fear causes them to hide, and the hiding causes Midian to just grow stronger. So it's a cycle, and it's exactly the same with our insecurity. We feel like we're being attacked with our insecurity. We hear the thoughts, we're not enough, we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, we're not pretty enough. We hear the thoughts that we're being attacked by insecurity, and that insecurity causes us to live in fear. And because of that fear, we retract into our caves. We retract into our relationships. We look for ways to cover it up and hide it. And we never actually deal with it. And because we're not dealing with it, the insecurity only gets worse. It only gets worse. And our insecurity gets stronger. And our fears grow worse. And it continues to spiral out of control. And we need to break that cycle. So the question we need to be asking is how do we break this cycle? cycle of insecurity. And here's what I believe. Here's what I believe. Nope, not that one. Um, so here's what I believe. I believe that if you created this enemy, which you did, we said before that if you that you created your insecurity by believing the lies that the devil was telling you instead of listening to the truth that God was telling you. And so if you have created this enemy, then you can conquer it. If you created it, you can conquer it. And we can conquer it by breaking this cycle of insecurity. By fighting back against the lies, by declaring the truth. And here's the truth. Here's the one truth you need to know in order to conquer any insecurity. You need to know this truth in order to conquer your insecurity. This one truth will destroy and shut up all of the reasons that you're insecure. Every time you ever hear the devil say that you're not enough, you can answer back with this one statement. You are worth dying for. You are worth dying for. That is the truth that overcomes all insecurity. That is the truth that overcomes all self-doubt, 
all self insecurity issues, all self self uh, inflicted uh, insecurity issues. Whenever the devil is in your ear saying that you're not enough, you're not tall enough, you're not strong enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not smart enough, you're not skinny enough, whatever it is, when the devil is telling you that you're not enough, you can point confidently to the cross and you can say, you know what? I'm enough for God to be willing to die for me. I'm enough for God to be willing to die for me. And if I'm enough for God, then I'm enough for myself. If I'm enough for God, then I'm enough for myself. But you see, when, when, uh, when Gideon eventually gets the commission in this story to go and defeat Midian, he gets the call by the angel of the Lord to go and defeat Midian, what's the first thing he has to do? He's got to get Israel to come out of their cave. And that's the first thing that we have to do too. We have to come out of our caves if we're ever going to defeat this enemy of insecurity. Now let me give you an example of that. Back in January I started my master's program. And I came into it feeling very confident. I was feeling incredibly excited. I was super excited to finally be around people who love Jesus and who are just as passionate about the Bible as I was. And I was so excited to learn from them and learn from my teachers and teach them things and, and just develop this community. I was so excited. And so I go into my first class, and the first thing we do is we do introductions. And so we, my teacher has each person go up and do like a four or five minute introduction of themselves, tell them about, their, about yourself. And as I'm sitting there watching person after person go, I'm feeling more and more like, oh my God, who am I? These people are all incredible. Because I see this one guy go up and he's written two books. I'm like, you're 24 years old and you've written two books. That's ridiculous. And then this other guy goes up and he's the lead pastor of a, of a 5,000 person church. And I'm like, what am I doing here? And then another person goes up and he's, he's a youth pastor of another church. And, and it's like person after person after person. This one girl, she's been on TV before. It's like, what? Like, who am I? And so I'm sitting there in my seat, and eventually it gets time to, for me to go up, and, and I have this feeling, I'm like, you know what? I've got to try to make myself look good. I've got to try to make myself look good so I can feel like I'm, like I'm on the same level with these incredible people. Not to mention I'm the youngest person in the class, and so I'm like, I've got to build myself up. And so I do. I, I didn't really lie to them, but I yes. did everything that I could to make myself seem as incredible of a person as I possibly could. And you know what that did for me? It just made me even more insecure. Because now I sit down and I'm thinking, okay, well now I have to live up to all those lies that I just told everybody if I'm ever going to feel good about myself. And so then this semester started just this past Monday and I have the same teacher. And so he has us do the same assignment. And so this past Monday I'm sitting there in class again and I'm watching all these incredible people go up. The youth pastor of Grace City is in my class. And so I'm like, who the hell am I? What, what am I even doing here? I'm feeling all the same things again. And this time, this time I have the moment where I realize I'm like, no, I'm not doing this again. I'm not going to do this again. It just perpetuates the cycle. I'm not going to hide in my cave of pride anymore. I'm going to be confident in who I am. Maybe I don't feel like I'm enough, but God has brought me here, and God has put me here, and so I know he's going to give me the ability <laughs> to be enough in this class. And I haven't gotten a chance to share yet, but I'm not going to blow myself up this time. Next week when I share, I'm not going to blow myself up. I'm not going to try to seem better than I actually am. I'm going to go up there, and I'm going to be as humble as I possibly can, because that is how you defeat your insecurities. It's by coming out of your cave and facing them and saying, I'm insecure, but I'm not going to believe that I'm not enough. I'm not going to believe that I'm not enough. You know what? God died for me. Of course I'm enough. Of course I'm enough. And I might not feel like I'm enough, but if Jesus died for me, then I know that I'm enough. And so I won that. I feel like I've won that particular battle with being insecure about my whole class. But there's a whole other world of other areas in my life when I'm still completely crippled by insecurity. And so what I'm telling you now is that this is a process. This is not something that's going to click overnight. 
I'm hoping that today sparks a change, but you're not gonna go out of here feeling completely free from insecurity. What I'm trying to get you to understand is that it is possible. It is possible to be free from insecurity, but you have to break that cycle by not going back to your cave. When you feel insecure, face it head on. Look at that insecurity and say, yes, that's a truth, that is a fact, but what you're saying about it is a lie. Yes, I am who I am, I am exactly who I am, but God doesn't say that I'm not enough because of it. God says that I am created in his image, that I am beautifully and wonderfully made. And you start declare, declaring the truth of scripture that I was worth dying for over your insecurities. And just like that, your insecurities lose all their power. So we've got to come out of the cave. We've got to come out of the cave. And that can be scary. It can be scary to come out of the cave. It was scary for me to know that next week I'm going to have to go up there and just be completely honest, be completely humble about who I am, about where I am in my life, and, and I'm not going to be insecure about it. That can be scary. And no matter what your cave is, it's going to be scary to not go, go back to it. It's going to be scary to come out of it. Don't you think the Israelites were scared to come out of their cave and fight the Midianites? But get this, and this is a huge revelation you have to understand. The truth that conquers that insecurity is that we were worth dying for. So yes, you are enough. But in order to come out of your cave, you need to believe one more truth. You need to believe one more truth. You need to believe that Jesus died, but then he didn't stay dead. When he was buried, where was he buried? Revelation, he was buried in a cave. He was buried in a cave. And Jesus came out of that cave so that we could come out of ours. You see, that's what resurrection power is. It's resurrection power that brought Jesus out of the cave. And it's the new life that you will experience when you put your faith in Jesus that can bring you out of yours. You see, Jesus came out of his cave in order to bring you out of yours. And whatever your cave is, whether it's a relationship, whether it's alcohol, drugs, whether it's pride and success, whatever your cave is, Jesus rose from the dead and came out of his cave to bring you out of yours, to give you the new life, to be able to walk in freedom, free from insecurity, free from self-doubt, free from self-harm, free from all the things that you've been so bound by in the past. And so when the devil comes and tells you that you are not enough, you can say, no, you know what? I was worth dying for. And not only that, I was worth coming out of the cave for. Jesus loved me so much. He came out of the cave. He didn't just stay dead. He came out of the cave and he's bringing me out of mine. Ooh. And so I'm not going to face yeah. these. I'm not going to face these insecurities with fear anymore. I'm going to face these insecurities with confidence. Knowing that I am good enough, knowing that I was worth the death of Jesus, and knowing that I can experience this new life today. And so as I close, I'm going to ask for everyone to stand on up. We're going to go back into a time of worship. Um, but before we do that, I want to ask you guys all two questions. Two very, very, very important questions. The first one is, if you have never put your faith in Jesus, or maybe you've raised your hand in the past, but you never really knew what it meant to put your faith in Jesus, let me make it incredibly clear. When I have you raise your hands for this first question, you are saying, I want to commit in this moment to living my life outside of my cave. I want to live my life outside of the insecurity. I want to follow Jesus wherever he leads me. I want to follow Jesus wherever he leads me. If you want to commit your life to Jesus, I'm going to ask that everybody bows their head and close their eyes so this can be a private moment. No one but me is looking around. On the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and you're going to say, Jesus, right now, I'm committing to follow you. If that's you, if you want to put your faith in Jesus and seal your name in heaven, ready? One, two, three. Lift your hand. Lift your hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right, you guys can put your hands down. If you just raise your hand, first of all, you made the best decision of your life. 
And I'm going to ask that we all pray together. We're going to pray this prayer together whether you raised your hand or not. You're going to repeat after me saying, Jesus, Jesus, thank you, thank you for dying for me, for dying for me and, raising again and raising again to give me new life. I put my faith in you alone. And from here on out, I will follow you. In Jesus' name. Amen. And the second question I have for you is if you have been believing the lies that you are not enough, if you have been believing the lies that you are not enough and it's caused you to live inside of this cave, inside of this cave of fear, inside of this cave of insecurity, I'm going to ask that you raise your hand right now and I'm going to pray for you and I'm, we're going to go back into worship and we're going to ask that Jesus would break these chains of insecurity now. So if you have been believing those lies on the count of three, ready? One, two, three. Lift your hand. I'm raising my hand too. I'm raising my hand too. We're, we're done living in insecurity. We're done living in fear. We're done living in insecurity. And so Jesus, we thank you so much for this message tonight. We thank you for speaking to us. We thank you for speaking to each and every one of us and helping us know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are so loved and we are so worthy and we are so worth it that you were willing to die for us. You were willing to die for us and you came out of your tomb so that we could come out of ours. Lord, give us the strength to walk in the freedom outside of our cave that you died to give us. Lord, we accept this new life. We accept freedom from insecurity. And we declare that we will see a victory over this enemy that is so pervasive in our minds. The lies of the devil have no power anymore now in Jesus' name. I bind the, the lies of the enemy in Jesus' name. And I pray that they don't have any power anymore. We will see this victory as we worship you, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.